Thank you. Thank you, Professor Goff. And uh, let me just register my appreciation to the audience this morning joining us um, for our first plenary. I think that the, the issue that we will be discussing today, or the range of issues within the context of small, middle, and emerging powers in the UN system, is of extraordinary importance and could not have come at a more pivotal and indeed topical moment. And in real terms, the discussion on global governance of security and crime pre prevention <coughs> excuse me, is at the, the very center of the, the whole range of, 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 of key issues that continues to bedevil the Caribbean security agenda, not unlike, obviously, other regions around the world. <clears throat> Consonant with that, we, I think, have assembled a very appropriate panel that will give what I'm sure will be a very broad hearing and earring to these issues. We have from the OAS Public Security and Counterterrorism uh, Department, SICTE, as we know it in Washington, Mr. Sheridan Hill, Professor Ramesh Diosaran of the University of the West Indies. We have, or is it the University of Trinidad and Tobago? We have, as I have it here by program, we have Major Colin Millington, Director of the Regional Intelligence Fusion Center, RIFC, who will speak on behalf of CARICOM Impacts. And we also have Susan Alfonso of the Caribbean Coalition for Development and the Reduction of Armed Violence and Women's Institute for Alternative Development. I am not sure where um, Professor Diosaran necessarily hails from or Ms. Alfonso. But we have, of course, uh, um, a dominance of Trinidadians, appropriately, I think, on the panel. Trinidad, as you know, within the CARICOM system, is in charge of uh, the Prime Ministerial Subcommittee on Regional Security. And, of course, a, a very key and critical area. I just want to turn, before I invite Professor Diosaran to address us, and of course we'll acknowledge the succeeding panelists in um, their specific turn, um, <clears throat> that there have been some challenges that for the most part have continued to, de to bedevil the international system. As far as looking at the issue of global security is concerned, in December 2004, Secretary General Annan um, asked the uh, United Nations to assemble a body um, that would constitute a, effectively a high-level panel to look at this matter. If my memory serves me correctly, in September of 2005, the General Assembly of the United Nations considered that report Coming four years later, four and a half years later, as we look, for instance, at the recommendations, which I'll not necessarily go through now, we can only but conclude that while there is an awareness of what the challenges are, the road and the movement to addressing those challenges uh, really has not yet been tread and with the attendant consequences of that. It is a time, quite frankly, where there has to be, at least in my opinion, a new assessment of the global system with respect to security. I think that it is reasonable to argue that the existing paradigms that do exist are increasingly becoming less and less relevant we 
saw, for instance, um, after September 11th, the reemergence of unilateralism, particularly in relation to how the engagement with the United Nations took place and the aftermath as, as far as the campaigns in Iraq were cons uh, was concerned and to a lesser extent in Afghanistan. And while there may have been arguments um, proffered that had a fairly credible basis as we, we can look at them both at that time and now in hindsight, the fact is that they did serve to bring into question the future of a multilateral approach towards security. I am also arguing that with this new change, there has to be a consideration of the whole reality of non-state actors in an extremely different and more, if you will, inquisitive context. It has to be very seriously examined and looked at and not just on the question of terrorism, which is where this debate has essentially resided, but the whole range of other players, non-state actors that are consequential within the international system. We're looking in this respect, and very appropriately, obviously, at international capital, civil society, non-governmental organizations, and the media, the role of these entities really in shaping this new discourse. And even at a time when we are having more discussions on the matter of transnational threats, again, fully focused on issues within the, the terrorism domain, I cannot say that there has been any commensurate alignment, certainly between the North and the South, in terms of advancing this conversation. My other point is that there has to be a higher regard for the whole issue of multidimensional security. Looking at security in this global context and the range of key economic areas, key environmental questions that all feed into this um, very, very fundamental, important um, issue. And just to tease this out a little bit, the whole issue of climate change which is not something that five, six years ago, um, as <clears throat> many of our states, even the Caribbean, <clears throat> excuse me, saw this as being largely inconsequential. This is at the, the very center of, of our reality right now and has application and relevance to a range of countries notwithstanding size or development. We saw, for instance, just again to tease out the whole public security dimension of this, what happened in the city of New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, the kind of dissolution of civil order that took place in, in that city. City, of course, in the most developed country in the world. The implications of that, and we know that for the most part, that catastrophe was largely occasioned by um, Hurricane Katrina. We look, for instance, at Haiti and what has been happening to its development um, priorities. Last year, four hurricanes hit that island, and of course, the downstream impact that has resulted from that. We remember Grenada um, with Hurricane Ivan, if my memory serves me correctly, 2004, where for two or three days, there effectively was not a government in place in that country. These are matters that are influenced by a range of non-traditional security realities which have to be addressed. And of course, the whole relevance and place of regulatory slash legislative constructs that really assist the governance process within the global security domain. Looking back again at the UN, in my area, for instance, United Nations Security uh, Council Resolution 1540, preventing the trafficking and spread of weapons of mass destruction. So we have a broad menu, 
and I think that we have an able panel to examine these issues. And one of the things I'm going to do is to certainly invite our audience to be very, very involved. I, for one, am not a person wedded to having the discourse fully directed from the platform. I think that we all here need to share. We need to put our perspectives in the mix and really add to what I believe and I intend to see as a robust discussion on this panel. Thank you, and with this, I'm going to invite Professor Dior Sarand to address us. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> our very distinguished visitors, I was from the University of the West Indies until recently. I am now at the University of Trinidad and Tobago. We are developing some new programs in criminology and public safety. This podium was my favorite spot when I was at UWE. I give my lectures from this vantage point, so I feel at home, and I want to welcome all of you. Patricia, thanks for deciding to come to Trinidad. This is going to, this is, will, it is sure that you will have a good conference. After all, the key organizer here is Tim Shaw, so I guess with a name like that, the assurance is certainly given. I want to be quite concise and run through the presentation because I want to give you something more concrete than my own words. I want to give you an indication of the crime picture, a portrait of crime and violence in the Caribbean, so I want to leave a few minutes for that. To begin with, the emphasis and the growing trend on using global statistics for national policies to me can turn out to be a misguided option for two particular reasons. Global statistics tend to ignore, and um, inevitably so, cultural context in which crime occurs. Secondly, by using global statistics and global policy, with few exceptions, maybe the one on terrorism, narcotic trafficking, and so on. But for the range of crimes for which global statistics are used, and to make the inference about best practice and so on, which are quite attractive to do, we miss the presence of mediating variables, which tend to push the explanation for crime in one direction or another, and beyond gross statistics like GDP, poverty, and unemployment. In the Caribbean, those gross indicators do not really explain crime, and therefore we have defective policies, those that seem to use perpetually gross statistics. We in the Caribbean, therefore, if you want to understand what's happening to us and to put it in the global picture for comparison, for further understanding, um, being vulnerable societies as we are, with border security challenges, being small islands as we are, we need a new methodology, and to put it briefly, one that speaks to motivation, opportunity. And the analysis and the policy development must be situationally driven. You see, you can, if you don't understand motivation in criminal behavior, you'll forever be lost in trying to solve it in other ways without an understanding of motivation. You can kill a terrorist, but unless you don't kill the idea itself behind terrorism, unless you don't damage the motivation or reduce the motivation, which is what Obama's speech was really all about, the motivation for conflict, more precisely terrorism, if you don't kill the idea, meaning the motivation, I don't think policy making can be very effective. As the chairman in indicated, there are serious defects in the existing paradigm, to use his words. I remember I was in Turin a few years ago at the invitation of the United Nations Office of Drugs and Crime, and there was a group, expert group meeting, and Mr. Van Leek, <coughs> John Van Leek, one of the panelists, was making a profound analysis and comparison with Singapore and other countries, and it looked quite a compelling argument in explaining crime and looking how law and order can be controlled, except to see, as I intervene, Singapore has a very con different constitutional arrangement from many countries in the world in terms of freedom of speech, freedom of movement, and so on. So you cannot ignore context when you make a cross-national comparison because you will get lost. 
The other issue in the Caribbean as a whole is this severe lack of accountability in our state institutions, those designed to look after law and order. So you cannot explain crime only by the statistics. You have to penetrate into the work of the institutions, which in our case are quite weak. And perhaps you can see this defect as one of the symptoms of a developing region. But notwithstanding the explanation or the excuse, I think we have a lot of work to do in accountability. That is, job specifications, performance, evaluation and sanctions. We are very weak for many reasons, some being political patronage and some being defects in the institutions themselves, especially in the administration of justice, to demand accountability. Thank you. Sorry, the, um, the pointer dropped and my chairman is very helpful. This brings me to a sore point. You see, the relationship between lack of accountability will have to be put alongside the weaknesses in the institution itself. And our administration of justice has so many serious defects that sometimes they are difficult to solve because you have, under the Westminster system, even it is a loose arrangement, separation of powers. So the executive and even the parliament itself I'm also a member of parliament, so I can tell you from first-hand experience, it is difficult to correct things in the judiciary without see seeming to transgress the separation of powers. So we need not only a new methodology in dealing with crime, we need a new political architecture in the Caribbean to deal with criminal justice and more so the management of crime. The dilemma that faces people like myself and perhaps all of you who belong to universities, especially, is the question of funding. In our region, there are very few, if any at all, I can point out to none really, apart from the international agencies, but any indigenous foundation that provide grants for crime research or research into criminal justice. We get those funds mainly from the government and the other public agencies which are themselves, in my view, part of the problem in terms of the performance, accountability. So how can you write a proper report, reliable and valid, implicating the very funder who gives you the money? You will only have, there are, there, are, there are two chances you will get, your first and last. I am always ambivalent about speaking to an international audience about matters that concern my country which I love very, very dearly, or about my region. But I guess as academics in the fellowship of scholars, you will appreciate that I have to bring you up to date as far as I can in the true university tradition. So it's not to condemn my country or my society, but it's merely to point the need for a new direction and to emphasize the words of our distinguished chairman once again, to change the paradigm. We have some very serious challenges. The most basic one in my view is the one between maintaining our freedoms and trying to deal with matters of security. And that very pervasive challenge is facing the United Kingdom and the United States and especially smaller countries where the need for security is so forceful but yet people need to evolve and become civilized in having a society where basic freedoms are maintained. We face challenges in terms of imminent legislation on telephone tapping, bank privacy, and the exposure of personal data. Many people don't like those trends, but it tells you again of the clash between freedom and security. We have issues like border security, drug and human trafficking. We have a culture of lawlessness across the Caribbean because we are bringing in alternative systems of justice. They're all trying to secure the first imperative of law and order. And we get carried away by bringing alternatives and substitutes, and thereby through financial resources and policy attention, ignoring the commanding imperative for maintaining law and order. 
not repression, law and order. And I think we have to revisit our policies because that seems to be something that is sliding on the scale. We have a number of issues in school violence and delinquency. So we really need radical improvements, to put it simply. My own approach as a teacher and in the new methodology is to emphasize the role of social psychology in explaining criminal behavior. Because social psychology, briefly, gives you the opportunity, not only in terms of definition, the relationships between people, between individuals and the environment, but it tells you that how the environment influences people and how people get stimulated by things that they imagine, if not actually happening. So it takes you into the realm of symbolic interactionism, but more than that, it gives us the opportunity for criminologists and agents in criminal justice to become agents of change. Because in social psychology, it also tells you, explains, and points the way how you can be an activist in your community. I believe criminology and agents in criminal justice have been a bit too withdrawn in public debate and getting more involved in the public domain. Because if you don't, others will fill the gap. And they do so with very superficial analysis and propositions. There is a United Nations World Bank collaborated effort that, that is produced in a report on crime, violence, and development in the Caribbean. It was published, I believe, in 2007. Why do I refer to that? It tells you again about the fallacies that global analyses can cause to countries like ours and for people who do not understand the difference between situationally driven reasons for crime and using global analysis for policy making. In the 10 point summary of this report, that the statement reads as follows. If Jamaica and Haiti reduce its rate of homicides, each will see an increase of 5.4% GDP annually. Not 5%, but they went so far to specify 5.4%. It is more than a mystery. It looks so supernatural in my view. First of all, the relationship between GDP and homicides is still very questionable. There are too many intervening indicators, and there are too many cultural and contextual variables. And I will illustrate that to you in a few minutes. So these, you know, it sounds nice, 5.4%. It's like magic. But it is in the need to give global inferences that I believe drive such fanciful statements with due respect to the authors, because I was one of the advisors on that report, but I was not responsible for this statement. I dealt with other issues in the report. But the report itself, when you peruse the hundreds of pages, it falls short of dealing with context and cultural variation, things which are very important for society like the Caribbean. From Jamaica to Guyana, you will see cultural nuances and institutional variations that really are major contributors to the phenomenon of criminal behavior and institutional defects. The macro indicators, yes, poverty, unemployment, even discrimination, GDP. But between those macro indicators and the behavior itself, there is a myriad of factors that really need to be considered in the Caribbean as with other parts of the world. So let me now get to some of the slides here. Yeah. This is a statement that is driving my own attention to policy making. I am saying that if you want to develop a Caribbean criminology or some theory of criminal justice in the Caribbean, even for teaching, not only for research, for teaching, we have to look at the functions of our institutions, how our institutions are functioning, meaning more precisely and more importantly, the police, the administration of justice. Because people feel crime is caused, quite commonplace, by poverty and so on, family breakdown, yes. But human nature, human behavior is also guided by consequences for behavior. If you know if you do this, that will happen to you, 
that anticipation of a consequence will determine whether you'll repeat that wrongdoing again, and vice versa for positive behavior. But we have a weakness in consequences in this country. Our case, some cases in the courts across the Caribbean, takes eight, nine, ten years. Witnesses disappear. Some are killed. How can you have a justice system when a case and a victim have to wait eight, nine, ten years? And when you have laws in the book that are not really enforced, and when you have sentences that are imposed by the judges, are also not enforced. And whether you want it or not, whether you'd favor it or not, across the Caribbean, with very few exceptions, you have on the books the death penalty, but it is not enforced for different reasons with the Privy Council intervention and so on. What that means in total, and related to the institutional effect, is an unfortunate loss of public confidence in our institutions, and unfortunately on the government itself. So when you have a loss of public confidence alongside weak institutions, you know the pathway to disaster is not too far unless you make some of the radical changes that the chairman and other people will point to. I will move very quickly because I don't want to detain you, but I'll just give you a glimpse of some of the charts. <clears throat> this is where we stand in the rest of the world. Well, this thing is not... On the top, we stand at the top of the world. It's a nice place to stand if it is something good. Many people feel like get up this morning feeling on top of the world, optimistic and ready for the day's challenges. In this case, we are on top of the world as a region. 100,000 in terms of homicide, murder rates, if you want to use the synonym. We are 30 per 100,000. And the rest follows. That is not a nice place to stay. And I guess that's one of the reasons Professor Goff and her colleagues decided to come here and help save us from further damnation. I promise I wouldn't be too long. I know time is of essence, but I need to, I need to justify my presence here, you see. Next one. Thank you, Am Chairman. Well, this tells you an interesting thing. We got independence in 1962, and from that year on, total serious crimes is the black one. It started to rise. Total serious crimes. Of course, murder went this way. But total serious crimes went this way. But you notice minor crimes came down. Minor offenses in terms of the pink jump remain so. But a lot of these statistics, as you know, have to do with the administration of the statistics themselves in terms of police statistics, how they're collected. And that's a whole story by itself. That's why we also need in the Caribbean, and I have a feeling governments are afraid, to put it bluntly, to do it, victimization studies. We are very weak in that respect. We can do it. I can do it. A lot of my students who are here can do it. But we need the, the funding. And it brings me back to the earlier question of the relationship between the funding and whether you will get further funding. Next one. Well, this is the homicide rate. Look what happens here. From 2000, it went up to 500, 600% increase without telling you the exact raw number. And this is a very heated political issue in the country today. Such rates can put a government in power or bring down a government. That is how public concern is implicated. Next one. It tells you now the GDP and unemployment. GDP went up drastically. We are $152 billion GDP, a rapid rise from 60 million or so in 2000 because of the oil and gas revenue. Our unemployment went down, so you would say in the gross statistical manner, this is a place where there should be peace, law, and order. This is almost like paradise with a low employment rate of 5% and a GDP. With such a rapid percentage increase in a few years' time, there might be no better place in the world to live than in Trinidad and Tobago, except to say we have one of the highest murder rates now in the world. How does a criminologist 
explain that. And that is one of the challenges that we are taking up. So it's much more than the macro indicators. Next one. Deportees. CARICOM governments together have been very ineffective in persuading the United States and other countries who send deportees back home. Because when deportees come back, you know the story, if they come back with shortage of resources, very few family contacts, and they are put on the streets, and the temptations for crime in order to survive and join in gangs become very real to them. And that, I believe, is very cryptically one of the explanations <clears throat> that contribute, if it doesn't add much, it contributes to the lawlessness we have in the Caribbean. So we have a very serious policy issue to work up with the United States, and I believe the CARICOM governments are going to represent themselves in a few months' time once again. It has not been a very sympathetic air up north, but I believe because of the implications. Because what I understand now is that as soon as the person is convicted in the United States, for example, without serving the sentence and then be deported, as soon as the person is convicted, that person is deported without even serving the sentence. So it produces a judicial implication. Next one. GDP and narcotics. The GDP went up, narcotics quite stable. It also calls for an explanation, right? because you would say on one hand, if you have a lot of money circulating, narcotics could be easy to buy. If you have less money circulating, crime will increase because you're fighting for turf and competition for drug trafficking will increase. So in any way you look at it, there is a lot of room for critical thinking in criminological analysis. And the policy makers and the funders should not stand in the way of what might call the truth. Next one. GDP and Larceny. Again, with a prosperous country, why would Larceny increase? Here again, you look at the mediating variables. Location. Is it so in the north as against the south? Is it in one class, another social class? Is it gender? So there are mediating variables to explain because the classical relationships do not stand. Next one. Woundings. All right. GDP. Next one. GDP and homicides, they are, very, they are first cousins. As the GDP increases, the guns start firing. Next one. Unemployment and larceny. Well, as unemployment went down, you see stealing in the loose sense increases. More jobs, what? more vehicles, more cell phones, more instruments for criminal conduct. What is the explanation? Again, the, the imperative for mediating variables. I only have a few more. So, narcotics. As unemployment went down, narcotics quite stable. And there is this feeling that narcotics contributes heavily to crime. I have some serious doubts about that. There are other factors alongside that that have to be considered. You see, we can no longer get away, as the chairman trying to warn us, with fashionable excuses. We as an emerging nation, and a developing society, if you want to say so, need to face the truth in order to start afresh, as it were. Next one. Well, there are two more I have. The last one is to tell you in secondary schools, we surveyed about 60 of our 100 secondary schools in the country. We did that over a period of years. And we found these offenses quite predominant. You would see violence, the one, these are violence, pelting, um, Fist fight, drinking alcohol in school, fighting with a weapon. I won't detain you inexplainable. Let me tell you just this briefly. Things are not going to get better if we do not take a radical approach to these problems. The nice sounding statements and the feel good policies will no longer work. And I say so with all the responsibility, with all the professional responsibility at my behest as a university person like yourself. The policymakers have to wake up. They have to make a fresh determination to work alongside university scholars in good faith and mutual respect and serve the society who pays their salaries. Last one. Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. And I think that this is where we'll certainly benefit from the, the range of, 
of um, um, differing focus areas that we would be exploring during this panel. Um, Professor Diosaran really brought it home in terms of looking, for instance, at a, a national scenario and the attendant challenges that are posed and obviously how that feeds into the whole panoply of regional concerns in that regard. And this is where I think as our discussion ensues, it really would be good to have our discourse informed uh, by members of the audience. We will be turning again, and, and, and it's a bit of a, of a strategy, I suppose, to have our slash operational um, institutional people, um, Mr. Hill and Mr. Millington, um, going last. But what I'd like to do um, is certainly to have a more unfettered discourse taking place. And so would certainly like at this time to invite Ms. Susan Alfonso from the Co Caribbean Coalition for Development and the Reduction of Armed Violence and Women's Institute for Alternative Development to uh, address us. I indicated earlier that civil society as a part of the whole mix of non-state actors that are becoming even more consequential have to be heard from. And so we are distinctly pleased to have Ms. Alfonso to offer those perspectives today. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I just want to make sure I'll time myself so that I don't overstay my, my welcome. Um, Mr. Chairman, distinguished members of the panel, and distinguished participants. The Caribbean Coalition for Development and the Reduction of Armed Violence wishes to express its appreciation for availing our organization of the opportunity to share our perspective on the issue, and it really is a community perspective. The coalition is a civil society group effort to address the crisis of armed violence in the Caribbean and its effect on development. We affectionately refer to the coalition as CDRAV, has also campaigned to raise awareness about the social impact of gun violence and is conducting research and analysis on the existence and effects of legislation and policies introduced to reduce and prevent armed violence. The member states are Antigua and Barbuda, Belize, Dominica, the Dominican Republic, Grenada, Guyana, Haiti, Jamaica, St. Kitts, St. Lucia, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Trinidad and Tobago, the Turks and Caicos, and Venezuela. The availability of small arms has an important role in raising the level and deadliness of violence in society and impacting upon the development of our region. Much of the response to this has resided in a criminal-centered approach. The issue of crime and violence and armed violence must, however, be addressed at multiple levels. Some heightened levels of violence affect direct forms of human, social, and economic activity. There's direct impact on the quality of life, productivity, the cost of goods and services, the value of property, investment, and industry. The misuse of small arms causes death and injury to thousands of people in our region every year, and it destroys livelihoods and promotes cultures of fear and terror. Deaths and injuries from violence constitute a major public health challenge. The cross cost of treating firearm injuries can be exceedingly high. One exercise to estimate the cost of violence in Jamaica in 2006 revealed that the direct medical cost in that year totaled 2.1 billion Jamaican dollars for injuries from interpersonal violence. Winad, is, and that is the Women's Institute for Alternative Development, which acts as a coordinating body and secretariat for CDRAV, is hoping and attempting a similar study in Trinidad and Tobago and through the Caribbean Coalition, hopes that several other countries will also pursue this course. Violence, and particularly armed violence, has significant and disastrous impact on our social structures in terms of family and community cohesion, gender relations, and other in traditional institutions. The decrease, and in some instances, the loss of social and community cohesion 
leaves a significant part of the population incapacitated to address human security issues and to organize collectively to find meaningful and non-violent dependent solutions. For some residents, and perhaps they are in the minority, there is an option to relocate. And for many, that option simply does not exist. In April 2009, a two-day women's regional conference hosted by WINAD in collaboration with UNICEF in Trinidad, the representative of the Kingston and St. Andrew Action Forum noted that there are two types of violence impacting women in Jamaica, gang violence or community violence, and gender-based violence. I wish to quote from her presentation so that you could really understand the experiences of communities in Jamaica, and I dare say perhaps in other countries in the region. And the quote starts, in most of the low-income urban communities, women who are intimately involved with dons and shutters have no other options but to carry and conceal weapons for these men. And in some instances, they even have to wash the blood-stained clothes after offenses are committed, all of which must be done without refusal as refusal could be extremely dangerous for them. These women also become targets for opposing gangs in times of conflict. In these inner city communities, the dons are most times considered in favorable light, as their presence signifies complete protection for the community. They can request whatever service they require from members of the community, such as sexual favors, which most times are acquired from teenage girls. The mothers usually comply for some main reasons. Saying no could result in their death or in serious injury. The dons are usually responsible for providing and contributing to the well-being of their families. And in some cases, community residents reported the distrust of law enforcement personnel because they consider them to be on the payroll or on the take of the dons. In Haiti, the history of violence and gun violence is distinctly related to the situation of political crisis in the country. Small arms are a destabilizing force and have become increasingly easily accessible to various factions and militias, as well as to criminal gangs and civilians. The large quantity of small arms in circulation increases criminal activities and human rights abuses, including sexual violence. In 2006, the United Nations estimated that up to 50% of girls living in areas characterized by high levels of violence, where most men have guns, like City Soleil, have been raped, and that in other areas of Port-au-Prince, that was common, gang rape. In February 2007, 50 cases of rape were reported in a three-day period in Port-au-Prince. Another alarming trend is the high incidence of these, in, of these uh, incidents by groups of armed men. Rape is just a common practice among criminal gangs. The prevailing state of lawlessness and the lack of public security enables such a high incidence of sexual abuse. Women's organizations and other NGOs working in support of the victims have seen a rising number of rape complaints occurring in the homes of the victims. The consequences, and I quote, are numerous, deep, and painful, with the violence impacting victims psychologically, medically, economically. In Jamaica, over the past 10 years, over 10,000 men, mostly youth, have been killed in violent circumstances. The tragic loss of one of Jamaica's most precious resources is compounded by the thousands more who have survived violence, but are injured, maimed, and traumatized. The Ministry of Health report on violence-related injuries for the period January to December 2008 revealed that 1,072 persons, 939 males and 133 females, were treated at public hospitals for gunshot wounds. In St. Vincent and the Grenadines, over 60 cases, including 15 murder matters, were down for hearing at the criminal assizes in January 2009. This may seem a very small number, but is a significant percentage in a country that has a population of 10,000. And in 2008, there were 5,654 crimes in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. 
Non-governmental community-based organizations play a vital role in addressing crime and armed violence in society. Women's groups engage the police and social workers in domestic violence intervention and prevention training, since many crimes are committed against women in their homes. Angry partners prefer to shoot, kill, or wound women who wish to leave the abusive environment. The threads of experience of violence and armed violence are similar throughout the region. From November 2008 to April 2009, WINAD undertook a project entitled Empowering Women and Girls to Prevent and Address the Impact of Small Arms and Light Weapons in 10 Communities in Trinidad and Tobago. I just want to highlight some of the, the comments that were made during our conversations with the women across Trinidad and Tobago. They articulated impacts at four different levels, but I will just choose three. In terms of the personal level, they spoke of the fear of going out and returning late. The fear as single mothers of having relationships with men because of incest and because also of possible acts of violence. The experience of being an eyewitness to fatal armed violence. The fear of intervening in situations of violence. The loss of the right to be free. Feelings of hopelessness. The disruption of daily routines. The vulnerability of being women desensitization to the issue, paranoia, and the reality of children becoming orphans. At the level of their households, they noted the need for increased security in homes, which led to an increased and unexpected cost, the reality of becoming prisoners in their own homes, the desire to change residence but the inability to do it, and the need to send their children abroad and away to study. At the community level, they talked about the stigmatization of their communities, the increasing incidence of both young persons and the elderly being forced to lie down on hot pitch during law enforcement initiatives, the decision by persons in the community to remain silent, high-risk communities not being served with simple amenities, the creation of borderlines because of gang conflict, and just the isolation of some women within their very communities. At the state level, they talked about political and institu institutional inability to deal with the issue and the loss of confidence in the, in the capacity of systems to protect victims. One conversation noted the inappropriateness of the education system. We thought this proved to be pointed because it was steeped in the language of the rights of children, which is not a common approach of the community to the needs of the young. The group that stood out for us, though, in these conversations came from the St. Jude's Home for Girls, which is a residential facility for girls who have, many of whom have already been uh, experienced, have already experienced violence or are perpetrators of violence. They identified violence coming from the following sources, from unwanted pregnancies, from what they call parry shots, and that is gang rape, from statutory rape. They, they also have experienced school violence and have also been perpetrators in that as well. They've also experienced retaliation for just being informers, for, for talking about what's happening. They spoke about an interesting thing called ranking. Ranking is a way in which young people gain status among their peers and in the communities and how they form hierarchies. Young men are ranked by how gangster, and that's in inverted commas, they are. That is, uh, how, how much they are involved in the drug trade or in gang lifestyles. They are also ranked by, by the fact that they possess finances. They are ranked by the number of people they have killed. They're ranked by the type of girl that they have, and, and they refer to it as, a, as best girl in their language. Girls are ranked by the level of the gangster boyfriends they have, whether these boyfriends are leaders of gangs, the amount of jewelry they have, and the ranking system is violent. And the young people know that, and they acknowledged it. And they also said that that ranking starts as early as standard four in our country, which is between ages nine to 10 years old. We just have some recommendations or some, some strategies that we discussed at the regional forum, and I just wish briefly to, to mention them. 
We spoke at the level of international policies and gun control there. And we think that it is very essential that at the international level, there be serious commitment to the, the several conventions and the several international instruments, as well as hemispheric and regional instruments, which govern the use of firearms, the control of firearms. We think that it is very necessary that com the commitment that has been signed on to, that governments oblige themselves to putting in place and implementing the provisions in their national and domestic legal frameworks. International agencies like the UN, uh, regional agent, hemispheric agencies like Project Plowshares are at the forefront of these kinds of interventions. We think that mainstreaming gender into the discussion on violence helps to create a wider vision of possible solutions. We also believe that context must dictate the approach to gun violence. Approaches cannot just be prescriptive and applied from one country to the next. There must be deep investigation into the circumstances in the country to understand what really needs to be implemented so that the violence and, uh, can be mitigated. We think that relationship building is key. There are many actors, law enforcement, the state, civil society. We also think of, of programs to create change. And this is in the realm of education, it's in the realm of cultural activities, it's in the realm of sporting activities, it's in the realm of helping people to, to exercise their potential for becoming entrepreneurs, legally that is, so that people don't feel incapacitated, people don't feel unable to live the lives that they are meant to live, lives, lives of dignity, lives without fear, freedom. We also look at interventions for youth and for peace building initiatives because the youth have a different system of dealing with issues and we're coming to understand very clearly that there perhaps are not rational processes taking place in the minds of our young people so that it is very easy for them to adopt violent, uh, violent approaches to their situations. Trying to solve the problems of guns and violence in our respective communities and countries we know is not an easy one. And because the problem didn't happen overnight, it cannot be fixed overnight. Governments have to do more in fighting corruption and in restructuring and repositioning key resources and assets in helping to fight this very serious problem. Governments must also build on the efforts spearheaded by institutions such as the United Nations, UNICEF and the UNDP that have both made it clear that increasing the long-term social investment and its accompanying social intervention programs must be part of an effective and sustainable solution to the gun and the crime problems. It is also very critical that civil society organizations continue to mobilize and align themselves in a way that will truly make a difference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Susan Alfonso. Again, another very insightful um, presentation and really adding on in you know, a number of key dimensions to what um, Professor Diosaran had focused and additionally of course speaking to the whole question of involvement of civil society how that vein if you will in this um, process can really help to move the discussion forward on these very very critical issues and again really anticipating more of this kind of discourse when we get into our um, question and, and um, answer period. I'd like to quickly invite Mr. Sheridan Hill from the Department of Public Security and Counterterrorism um, of the OAS to address us now and followed of course by Mr by Major Colin Millington. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Well, first, let me say thanks to the Academic uh, Council of the United Nations System for organizing this conference.
and thanks to the University of the West Indies and the Institute of International Relations, my alma mater, for agreeing to host this conference. And thank you also to the panel, my fellow panelists and to the participants. Uh, the, the issue of the global governance of security, terrorism, and, and crime prevention is pretty broad. And in the limited time frame, I, I propose to touch on four, four areas and make some closing remarks. First, I'll give you an idea as to the OAS definition of security, our management structure, the, our initiatives in the Western Hemisphere, how we collaborate with the other international actors in the region, and my closing remarks. Firstly, the OAS position on, on security has evolved in a number of General Assembly resolutions, and in the Bridgetown Declaration in 2002, they've agreed that the definition security is multidimensional in nature. It includes the new and emerging non-traditional threats. It includes economic aspects, political, social, and environmental. Our management structure in the OAS is the Secretariat of Multidimensional Security. That's the department that has responsibility for security. It includes the Inter-American Committee Against Terrorism, SICTE, and most people normally around the region ask what, how does SICTE relate to the Inter-American Committee Against Terrorism. It's just the Spanish acronym for the Inter-American Committee Against Terrorism, which is responsible for terrorism matters in the OAS. The Inter-American Drug Abuse and Control Commission, CICAD, is the department responsible for drug-related matters. The Department of Public Security, in which I am based, is responsible for more or less everything that falls outside of terrorism and drugs. So there we look at police, prisons, pri private security, the ministries of national security, some of the new and emerging threats, gang violence, trafficking persons, and issues of that nature. And there's also the depart Department of Policy Coordination and Evaluation of Projects, which is to ensure that there's a coordination among the departments. Within the region, the, the CICAD, as the Inter-American Drug Abuse and Control Commission, uh, has assisted the region in four main areas. The demand, demand reduction uh, program, the supply reduction program, the multilateral evaluation mechanism, and the Inter-American Drug Observatory. Within the Inter-American Committee Against Terrorism, we have a number of security programs on aviation security, port security, document security, uh, threats to critical infrastructure, and I might also add this includes cyber security and tourism security. And here in our midst, we have uh, Lieutenant Colonel Anthony Philip Spencer, our defense attache in Washington, D.C., um, and he is really the godfather of the Inter-American Tourism and Recreational uh, Security Program. This program came about when Trinidad and Tobago chaired SICTE in the 2005-2006 period. We also have a number of policy engagement exercises, and we have, international cooper we have cooperation with the other international actors. The Department of Public Security is responsible for police, prisons, private security, uh, the Ministry of National Security, the structure of the ministries, uh, police reform, gang violence, trafficking in small arms and light weapons, trafficking in persons. We have an observatory on crime and public security issues. And we're also involved in research in public security areas. With respect to collab collaboration with international actors, at the multilateral level, we work with the United Nations and different entities within the UN. We work with the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, the International Atomic Energy Agency, and other, other entities within the UN. At the regional level, we work closely with CARICOM, we work at IMPACTS and COPACS. Other, other regional bodies, we work at the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, APEC and SICA in the, in the Latin American region. Within the OAS, various departments at times tend to work together. So you find that there'll be a CICTE DPS collaboration on issues where, on mutual issues, the Department of Public Security and CICAD, and CICTE as well as CICAD would also work, work on similar issues. My, 
My, my view for the way forward within the region is that I think there are a number of issues facing the region right now. I think, one, there should be careful analysis of the problems. There should be research-based, and as a law enforcement official, the C report, which highlights the region as one of the highest, the region as most crime, crime and violent prone, a number of things are happening right now. CARICOM recently implemented a new management structure for crime and security. The OAS is focusing its attention on the region, and the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime just signed a memorandum of understanding with regional leaders to do a whole range of, of, of uh, assistance within the region. I think, based on that, there should be collaboration among the member states. There should be collaboration among the international actors and all the, the assistance, all training, all the initiatives, all the financing and so on should be carefully coordinated. It should be well implemented and monitored. Additionally, I think there's a role for the University of the West Indies in all of this. We are, we are facing a bit of a watershed moment now where we have a high level of crime, violence, gang violence is, is very high in the region. We have high murder rates. The Caribbean has one of the highest murder rates in the world. And because of that, a number of things are happening. I think that the University of the West Indies has a role to play in assisting Caribbean countries respond to this, to this um, threat. And in that regard, I think Professor Ramsaran's, Yosaran's um, unit, I think Professor Harriet's unit in Jamaica also has a role to play in assisting the region in responding to the current the current problems. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hill. Without further ado or delay, I'm going to invite um, Major Colin Millington to address us. We are a bit pressed for time, as you can see. We've been attempting to keep as close to our schedule as possible, but we want to have at least 10 minutes for um, question and answer. So Major Millington will present and then we'll get right into our discussions. Hope we perhaps can grab a two or three minutes um, going into a break, but let's just try to be as expeditious as we can. Thank you. Right. <laughs> now that we have worked out the technology. Good morning. My name is Major Millington. I am the director of the Regional Intelligence Fusion Center. And much people will not know about the Fusion Center, but it was part of the security mechanism that was in place as part of the security arrangements for the Cricket World Cup in 2007. Um, based on its performance during that period and the successes, we were mandated by the CARICOM heads and we were established as a sub-agency of CARICOM Impacts, which forms part of the crime and security management framework that was in place uh, subsequent to the Cricket World Cup. My comments this morning are uh, being brought to you from the, on behalf of Dr. Edward Green, from the Secretariat, and from CARICOM in Bucks. And just so that I can put it into context, uh, just to give you an idea of the regional landscape, and as Dr. Dave Saran and a couple of the other speakers highlighted, I just want to reiterate by saying that our environment in the region is characterized by significant porous borders. Last check, we had approximately 9,700 miles of it. And uh, we continue to be negatively impacted by inadequate liaison with international partners, law enforcement, of course, numerous gaps, limited capabilities, weakened and vulnerable criminal justice system, and legislative challenges, particularly uh, anti-terrorism, cybersecurity laws. Um, based on this limited law enforcement and this landscape, we see these as the main threats that continue to impact the region. And you see uh, narcotics trafficking, as was highlighted earlier, um, arms trafficking, violent and organized crime, public health issues, irregular migration, terrorism, cybercrime, and the impact of criminal deportees. And quite a number of the previous speakers highlighted issues associated with a number of these threats. But from an implementation agency standpoint, these are what we see the threats are to the region. 
um, what have what are the menu of intervention, interventions that have been mandated by the CARICOM and CARICOM heads, and uh, based building on the mechanisms for or that were in place for the Cricket World Cup, we had installed at that time the Advanced Passenger Information System. And the Advanced Passenger Information System is paired with a watch list system that seeks to identify persons of interest coming into the region. So based on the system that was in place during the period of Cricket World Cup the, and the successes during the period of Cricket World Cup, and just to highlight the successes, we were able to identify 1,148 persons of interest coming into the region that were stopped at the borders that posed potential threat to the games during that period. And based on this impact and the fact that the mechanism worked, uh, CARICOM heads again mandated that the mechanism continue to exist long after Cricket World Cup. And based on that, the advanced passenger information system is in place across 10 nations, and it is currently being expanded to the remainder of nations within CARICOM to include the associate member states. We also look at the implementation of the advanced cargo information system, and it is pretty much similar to the advanced passenger information system, only it mandates vessels coming into the region to submit ahead of time their manifest list for both their personal and cargo so that the appropriate uh, screening can be done prior to them coming into the region. If it is detected based on that screening that the vessel or individuals on that vessel are persons of interest, or the cargo seems to fit a particular profile, that vessel is met at the border. So based on, again, the systems in place during the period of Cricket World Cup, these are, this is another measure that is currently being upgraded to exist throughout member states in the region. Um, I highlighted earlier the Regional Intelligence Fusion Center, for which I'm the director. The center really represents a coordination mechanism for intelligence within the region. And Based on an assessment prior to the Cricket World Cup, it was recognized that member states individually were experiencing challenges with reference to intelligence, and that now we had to deal with an international event that saw 16 uh, participate, pa participating nations coming in. It was necessary at that time to establish a mechanism for the coordination of intelligence. And Based on that and meetings with the international practitioners from the participating member states, we in place the Regional Intelligence Fusion Center, and the Fusion Center continues to exist today. It does coordination of intelligence. One of its tasks, and it continues to perform, is major event support, and it provided that support to Trinidad and Tobago during the recent Fifth Summit of the Americas, and will provide that support later on this year during the period of the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting. Another measure in place as a measure to assist with the um, environment is the implementation of a CARICOM travel card system. And this system is really to, to facilitate the fast travel of, of uh, CARICOM nationals throughout the region. But built into this system in itself is a, is a background screening process a similar process that was used during the period of Cricket World Cup that ties into the advanced passenger information system, a watch list system that highlights persons of interest. So in effect, what you have is an additional screening process for persons who want to get onto a trusted traveler regime. And really, it allows us to be able to do proper background screening on individuals coming into the region. And this mechanism the advanced passenger information system, the cargo system, are all supported by uh, MOU that has been established with the Interpol that allows us to tie in to the global system. So persons that are highlighted on our watch list system includes the 16 million person database that Interpol has that allows us to screen internationals as well as regional persons coming in or traversing the region. In terms of other crime and prevention strategies, the heads mandated the development of a capability to increase surveillance in firearms. And as part of our mandate um, of the UN Convention on Small Arms and Light Weapons, we see ourselves continuing to develop the capacity. And currently, on the, on the 
the project manager's desk is a system called the regional uh, identification, the regional information ballistic information network that allows crime weapons used throughout the region to be hosted on a central server so that comparisons can be done within member states throughout the region. And really what we're seeking to do is to be able to track weapons that are involved in crime throughout the region to, to be able to track it from island to island if it does move from island to island. So that if a weapon is involved in a crime in Jamaica and based on that involvement, it is quickly shipped to another member state and then turns up in a crime, let's say in Trinidad, at, at the, another end of the Caribbean, this system will allow Trinidad, having identified the weapon on a crime scene, to be scanned against information placed into this database and allow it to be able to be identified against weapons that were involved in crimes before. Um, recently, the region would have signed on to uh, e-tracing system offered by the Americans, and this also is part of the crime prevention strategy with reference to the identification of firearms that allows us to be able to track the source of firearms. And the American system really allows us to be able to enter the data on the outside of the weapon on an online system that allows it to be checked by the ATF to be able to determine its source. So again, it's another means of us identifying the source of weapons coming into the region and the routes coming into the region. We continue to engage international partners in anti-narcotics uh, efforts. And recently in Suriname, there was a direct engagement with the US with reference to threats to the region. And part of that engagement saw us uh, speaking to the effects of Plan Merida and intervention by the US on their southern border with Mexico, but one that is having a serious and negative spin-off effect by projecting uh, weapons and drugs into the region. And really the engagement sought to identify some of these uh, uh, effects of their plans and to have an open engagement that will allow us to be able to mitigate against some of the, the impacts of their plan. And this is another one of the measures that we um, uh, soon to be implemented. And again, the regional response to the criminal deportation from third states and Professor De Soran clearly highlighted the gap in terms of our current um, way of how we deal with it. Um, what from a CARICOM standpoint is being done. One, we had commissioned a study done by Dr. Anne-Marie Barnes a couple of years ago that identified uh, the fact that deportees and the nexus with the involvement in crime. And based on that study, she drafted what represents a menu of, um, menu of tasks that we should seek to engage the, the uh, metropolitan states who use deportation as a crime uh, control strategy coming into the region. And really, what she, what she uh, saw, saw to do is highlight exactly how we could go about engaging partners and some of the measures that we can put in place. And coming out of that, a uh, deportation uh, work group was established that will, again, have direct in, uh, liaison with the third member states, third states uh, that use deportation as crime strategies to have an open intervention. And we're not saying that we don't want to deport persons to the region. However, we would like to have some antecedents prior to people coming in, assist if uh, necessary by giving all the antecedents. In some instances, these states are saying, listen, we can't say to you a number of things except the current case that they were charged or deported for. And we are saying to those persons, as part of our strategy, listen, we need to know the criminal antecedents. What if this person is a pedophile? What if he's a rapist? And he's been charged for some other offense and we're not aware. So really what we're seeking to do is to have those persons properly documented when we come in. And as part of the documentation, we have developed a database, a regional database that allows member states to input, in, input that information onto that database so that, again, it allows us to scan advanced passenger information coming in, the, as well through the cargo system coming in, to allow us to be able to determine whether these individuals continue to be involved in some crime, crimes or the other within the, um, the state. In terms of the human resource development strategy, the heads mandated the retooling, retraining, and realignment of national and 
regional intelligence units. And this is an ongoing process that see us linking with, uh, again, Interpol and other metropolitan states with reference to um, the acquisition of training to upgrade the level of uh, skills of the law enforcement and security agencies within the region. The other measure is um, the development of specially trained, equipped, and dedicated teams of homicide officers. If you cast your mind back a year or two, there was uh, two major crime scenes in Guyana that saw Guyana having to request assistance from multiple states. And really, what this mechanism is, is seeking to do is to in, in place a, a management system that allows those persons to be coordinated by an entity that reports to the Commission of Police in that island so that um, crime scene, large crime scenes can be managed. The other measure is um, the polygraph capacity. And yes, integrity testing is a serious issue with law enforcement and other areas within the region. And as part of the standardization of a criteria for persons going into law enforcement and security agencies, CARICOM is looking to install um, integrity testing. As one, of, as one of the criteria, and of course, to ensure that you can maintain that, you need to have the polygraph capacity to be able to do that. And we are de currently developing a polygraph capacity within the region. In terms of the stakeholder imperatives and initiatives, I spoke about the watch list system, and that is an ongoing system that continues to be upgraded as and when uh, information comes in, and as, as and when partnerships are developed with third member states. The implementation of a regional security plan that sees us developing national security plans in each member state and um, imprinting over that uh, regional security plan. There's ongoing joint regional threat and risk assessments. The intel sharing continues to be developed, again, through the Regional Intelligence Fusion Center and through the secure means established at the center. Tracking of um, visitors and criminals through the advanced passenger information system. The establishment of a deportation working group, I mentioned that earlier the secure means to transfer intelligence and other information. And this is done through a mechanism set up at the Fusion Center that allows it to be transferred through a virtual privacy network. Some of the pending projects by CARICOM, development of a regional crime and security strategy, the implementation of a counter-proliferation strategy, the review of national joint coordination centers. And these centers are really a mechanism within a state that allows it to pull together all the law enforcement and security agencies so that you have coordinated efforts towards the, the implementation of crime uh, strategies, the implementation of a regional cybercrime, cybersecurity plan, the implementation of the carry pass, which is the travel card project, the implementation of the integrated criminal record system. And this really seeks to digitize crime records and how you record um, crimes in a member state and then to link it across member states to allow us to be able to com compare and do comparisons across states. And then the implementation of the investigation management system, as I spoke to earlier. Some of the key partnerships we see in us going forward, beside our third member states, third states, CARICAD, as highlighted by Mr. Sheridan earlier, CCLEC, which is the Customs Law Enforcement Council, Interpol, and I highlighted the fact that we have an MOU already established with Interpol, UNICRI and UNODC. And based on a meeting coming out of UNODC, the, there's supposed to be a reestablishment of the office in the Caribbean. Um, Barbados is supposed to be the host. So these are some of the critical partnerships that we see ourselves getting involved with to push the regional crime and security strategy. Um, where do you see ourselves going, having highlighted this menu of um, things? We saw many of. Um, events to impact on crime. We saw ourselves ending up with a desired end state, having an effective regional security mechanism, a well-defined regional security plan that includes prevention and detection, a 360 radar detection mechanism that is monitored 24-7, uh, maritime and aerial resources to respond to threats to the region, a strong criminal justice system, and ideal border control systems that see us continuing to um, upgrade the advanced passenger information and the advanced cargo information system to probably a hemisphere, um, hemispheric approach to advanced passenger and advanced cargo information system. Thank you.
Thank you, Major Millington. And we are, I guess, across the threshold already in terms of our time. But I'm not sure if Dr. Goff would um, allow us as the overall taskmaster here to have a couple of questions, maybe um, 10 minutes of questions, and we, could, we can have a shortened break. OK. OK, well, I, I am at um, 10.32. But um, what I'd like to do, however, um, to really run consistent with our topic here, and pretty much building a little bit on what um, I had emphasized in my opening remarks, which is assessing the whole power context within the United Nations system, how small states in, in the Caribbean, how regions like ours um, are equipping ourselves to really influence this debate, having the traditional large powers and those um, traditional areas of focus be more responsive to the Caribbean, to small states, to our realities, and in turn have the panel perhaps speak to what initiatives they are seeing on the ground, even as Colin Millington um, outlined the range of initiatives being undertaken by IMPACTS and by CARICOM, but how is that feeding into larger global management of crime and security is what we need to be looking at. So we can just, um, of course, lift our hands, identify ourselves, and we'll have panelists um, respond from the table. Um, the lights here are pretty formidable, I must admit, particularly for someone who wears glasses. But I'm seeing a hand here, um, um, and then one behind, gentlemen. Yes, you can go ahead, ma'am. Gentlemen, there, um, the green shirt, identify yourself and we can just move on. Keston Perry, student at the University of the West Indies. Uh, I wish to thank you for the presentations, very informative and insightful. What I wish to have seen and, and heard a lot more of is the non traditional security threats, which are a reality to the Caribbean given. Uh, as small island developing countries, as well as our insular uh, state. What, what I want to ask, though, is to Professor Diosaran, uh, given the, cult the context, the cultural context, as well as the context about which you spoke, how do you reconcile the transnational nature of crime and uh, the, in terms of crime prevention and, and crime fighting and with the, with the cultural context. Give, because we realize that the narco trafficking as well as you know, all the other incidents of crime are transnational in nature. How do you reconcile both issues? Let's just take one more question and then we can just go into a round of responses. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Uh, you have uh, uh, Professor Diosren has talked about the, the financial uh, crunch, uh, the, the non availability of sufficient funds for fighting uh, crime, justice administration system. But I think the, the, the uh, uh, 
multinational financial institutions uh, are spending money on crime and crime prevention and uh, justice sector administration uh, reforms. But my uh, point is, uh, if the money that is available to the region is properly being utilized, uh, in many cases we find that once the, the contract is done, uh, it takes long time to start the project actually, uh, it takes long time to actual, for, for the actual takeoff and the implementation. Uh, a consultant sitting in, in a different country, uh, you know, I mean, making a paper for the, 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 the problems, and later this will be forgotten. And countries uh, usually find, uh, you know, uh, they, don't, they don't show that much interest in implementing projects on crime and justice administration. If uh, there is a project for building a bridge or on agriculture sector, I mean, countries show interest. But the same interest and enthusiasm is no, not shown on the implementation of projects on justice sector reform. And after, say, five years, ten years, everything is forgotten. The money is either waived off, written off, and the project is nowhere. Thank you. Do we have one more? Yes, uh, Ken Stiles from Brigham Young University. Um, I noticed almost all of the uh, anal analysis had to do with domestic capacity and local coordination. I wonder to what extent you think, and this is particularly for Major Millington and Mr. Hill, uh, commitment to international exactly. rules. I think of all the anti-terrorism conventions, the small arms trafficking ban and so forth. To what extent do you think countries that commit to those international rules are more likely to be able to accomplish the goals that you're addressing. All right, thanks. So we'll just go with Professor Diosaran, and then we'll have Major Millington and Mr. Hill. The question of cultural context is used not merely in terms of traditional cultural symbols, dress, food, and so on. It has to do with institutional behavior, political patronage, and so on. Um, the administration of justice, which vary, and the deficiency suggests that these things do contribute, especially in terms of the ineffective deterrent. Let me give you an example. When the Kingfish Project in Jamaica became successful in drug blockage and so on, and other such successes in different parts of the region, you find there was a diversion of drug trafficking onto the borders of Trinidad and Tobago more emphatically. So that variation in, in, in policy success in one area contributed to what has happened to the drug intake in Trinidad and Tobago. There is, in terms of more narrow cultural context, we in Trinidad and Tobago are now experiencing the failure of the educational system in terms of increased school dropouts, a low standard of achievement in the schools, which briefly put contribute to grand formation because the alternatives in the community and we have very um, we have districts in the country where homicides gang formation and behavior are very heavily concentrated even within one country there are variations which contribute to the national figures so the crime like opportunity and socioeconomic privileges Crime itself is not evenly distributed across the country. And our explanation is that in the, 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 the east-west corridor in Trinidad and Tobago contributes disproportionately to crime because of these cultural variations, which has to do with family lifestyle as well and the administration of justice generally, court case backlog. It's, it, it's, it's a complicated answer, but I'm giving you some examples to show you that you, whilst you have global trends, universal laws about human rights, common standards. There are such fluctuations in criminal behavior, especially in terms of opportunity and motive, that make the cultural context very, very important. And um, something that is bothersome is, you know, you speak about policies, and with due respect to my distinguished fellow panelists, the policies in the implementation is not neutral. There's a lot of political patronage and uh, political bias in terms of implementing the very policies itself. In terms of hiring senior officials in key administrative positions, there is some dispute in parliament 
because whilst you should have, in my view, consensus in such appointments, there is a lot of fragmentation and broken consensus. So these local issues, without being too narrow and parochial, they do contribute from country to country, especially in the Caribbean, to the, my emphasis on contextual and cultural factors. And perhaps I can give you a longer discourse, but I think there are other questions that need to be answered. Mm -hmm. With respect to the, the question on states uh, signing on to international conventions, I think the, the states would consider the implications before they sign. Uh, with, with, with respect to the, the actual implementation, uh, the OAS also try to assist uh, member states in the implementation of some of these uh, uh, conventions. For example, the, the legislative uh, terrorist financing legislation and the Inter-American Convention Against Terrorism. I would expect the Inter-American Convention Against Terrorism is three-part. We assist states not, not simply with, with, sign, with, with, with rat, uh, just, not just urging states to ratify the, um, the convention, but also with respect to actual implementation, amendment of laws, and so on. So while the states would take uh, their interests, their priorities into consideration before they sign, the OAS also provides follow-up assistance with respect to the actual implementation of these legislation. I hope that answers your question. Just to reiterate what Sheridan highlighted, um, having signed on to a number of these conventions, you find that member states are at varying levels or varying degrees of um, abilities to commit. So sometimes financing, sometimes infrastructure really inhibit the ability to implement. So a lot of these, a lot of times you find that they are signed on, but the ratification and implementation takes long in coming. And um, CARICOM, at the level of the conference, the heads, have taken a decision to look at the member states who have signed on to specific uh, conventions with reference to crime and security and to urge them to ratify and to implement the measures necessary to uh, allow action to be taking place. Okay, I think we can take another round, maybe three or four, or are we drawing the line? I think that Taskmaster Professor Goff just through the line, but just want to say to you, thanks for being a part of our first panel. Uh, this session, I think, really teased out some of the critical issues on our security menu, and just to state that this should be considered as the commencement of a discourse as to, again, how small states, how a region like the Caribbean can continue to influence the international system in areas that are increasingly critical, not just to our security, but to our development. So this is a starting point. We really do thank ICUNS for really putting the spotlight on this. Thanks for coming this morning. <laughs>